if you make up your mind that you want to leverage your one life to see the next generation fall in love with Jesus and be radically shaped by his kingdom, you can expect opposition. Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. The goal, accelerating the movement of God through sharing revival truth, stories, and reports. Well, welcome to the One Cry Podcast. We're so excited to to uh, have you on on with us today. And uh, I'm Bill Eloff. This is Kyle Reno. And Kyle, I'm really excited about the next six or seven podcasts because right. uh, we're we're really focused on a an area that you and I deeply love. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you look, and I know our heart around this podcast is to remember the ways of God in revival and awakening in the past and to be reminded in such a way that it helps us lean and anticipate it now. And so focusing on the campus and college students specifically, the next generation in these weeks and remembering, hey, God has moved in these ways before. And what can we learn right now to best posture and position? And the other side, Bill, what's God doing? I mean, like what we're seeing movement and activity even now. Yeah. And and there is great activity. I think uh, all of us are aware of, (coughs) excuse me, what happened at Asbury this in uh, February of 23 and and the cascading effects of that on so many college campuses and many of us who follow this deeply are are really believing that that uh, we're going to see a greater explosion of that hopefully in nationwide revival right. and spiritual awakening like we've had every 40 to 60 years since right. 1735 so, Kyle, I know you you have you carry uh, always have ever since I've known you a deep passion for the next yeah. generation, and uh, kind of explain to us where that comes from. Where <laughs> right. does it come from uh, biblically, and maybe even where yeah. does it come from personally? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's my story. I was 19 years old when I came to save in faith in Christ through the witness of a baseball coach and walking into a gathering that was filled with God's presence and a real little R revival in a local church. So it ruined me. It ruined me. And at 42 now, I I am still living from what God did in me in that moment and believing and seeing it happen here in our local church, but believing to see it happen widespread across our nation in the lives of the future generation. And here's the truth, man. I'm reminded that there's nothing new under the sun, right? So if we're trying to create something on our own, we might as well stop. Instead of looking back and seeing God's redemptive heart and God's revivalistic heart from front to finish, and that he loves bringing bringing generations to himself. But I, I think the intent is this, and what I want us to look at in Ezra 3 for a second here is traditions a word that's used a lot. I mean, there's a lot of bad traditions, and religion does a lot of really weird stuff with tradition. But at its core, it's a pretty beautiful thought. That tradition at its purest is from hand to hand. From hand to hand. And as it pertains to the kingdom of God, there's things that's in God's heart that's intended to be handed from one generation to the next, and that they get to share in something that will matter. And so you see these moments, and God often does it around physical structures. You see this in the building of the temple. We see it even before that, from the tabernacle to the building of the temple to the rebuilding and the restoring of the temple. And you see a moment in Ezra 3 where there's the restoration. And I want to give us some principles here real quick to get us to that place where you see generation to generation. It says in Ezra 3 verse 1, it says, In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with, huge word, a unified purpose, a unified purpose. And here's something I know, Bill, we've talked about often. In revival, there's this real miracle that happens preceding in a real move of God, that God unifies his people around a specific purpose, that he unifies his people around a specific heartbeat, a desire to see God do something to see God do something in their lives, in their children's lives, and future generations' lives, that there there is no telling 
what God can do through a unified people. There is no limit to God's power being poured out on a people that are positioned together. That's why Psalm 133, 1 and 2 said, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's interesting that it says that that when unity happens, anointing comes. That when unity happens, anointing comes. And in that anointing, a a person and a people is given authority to accomplish something. So I just want to encourage our listeners, our pastors and leaders out there, college students even on the campus, and get unified around a real move of God. Get unified around the desire to see God do something in our day, to do something on your campus, to do something in the lives of college students in your church. But it goes on from that. There's more. I could stay there all day. It says, verse 2, Then Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, joined the fellow priest and the Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, with his family in the rebuilding of the altar of the God of Israel. That's verse 2. It skips down to verse 8, and I'm going to give you a principle here. It says, The construction of the temple of God began in mid-spring during the second year after they arrived in Jerusalem, and the workforce was made up of, you ready? Of everyone who had returned from exile. And then it goes and lists off some more people specifically. If we want to see a real move of God, if we want to see revival in our day, if we want to see a revival that radically impacts the next generation, there's going to be unified purpose, but there's also going to be personal responsibility. That it's not just a priest or a preacher or a pastor. It's not just a priestly line. It's just not the staff. It's just not a few, but it's every person finding their part and believing for a real move of God that impacts the next generation, meaning that everybody carries the same purpose and everybody finds their part inside the work, inside the mission, that everybody leans in and says, Lord, use me. There's a there's a weird spirit in our age, and if we don't think it's invaded the church, we are grandly deceived. And The spirit is this, is that I'm entitled to. I'm entitled to things. Even I, I'm entitled to things as a member of this church, or I'm entitled to things as a part of God's kingdom. Now, while there is a beautiful inheritance, there's 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 beautiful things that blessings that are promised to us by God. The kingdom of God is not about entitlement. The kingdom of God is the reality that we've been entrusted, that we've been entrusted with a personal responsibility to be a part of something that way outlives us, specifically as it pertains to the next generation, a personal responsibility to see this spread to others. I love what Joshua 24, verse 15 says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, we read that, and we put that up in our homes and stuff, but here's here's a statement inside of that. Joshua says, personal responsibility. As, as it pertains to me, I'm, I'm going to do... I'm going to work with what God has entrusted to me. But he takes it beyond him. As for me and my house and my children. And there's a principle here that moves even outside. It starts in our nuclear family, but it should spread to our spiritual sons and daughters. As it pertains to me and those that I can entrust these things to, I'm going to own my part. It keeps moving. As for three, beautiful things. Inside of you make up your mind, to have a unified purpose, to personally have personal responsibility, ownership of it, you can expect this. Verse uh, end of verse two, verse three says, and they wanted to sacrifice, burn offerings on it as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. <laughs> Here, here's the unfortunate reality: that if you make up your mind personally or as a pastor, as a part of a church, if you make up your mind that you want to leverage your one life to see the next generation fall in love with Jesus and be radically shaped by his kingdom, you can expect opposition. You can expect it because our enemy hates the thought of this kingdom spreading to future generations. And listen to me, and he'll use people to oppose it. If they, if they oppose it because of preferences, 
if they opposed it because of what once was instead of believing for what now is and what will be, you can expect opposition. And I, I think what I would encourage you with is this. When it comes, know you're in the right vein. <laughs> when opposition plays out, keep pressing forward because it's worth it. Because we are talking about the future of our faith. The future of our faith. So whatever it takes, whatever it takes to reach future generations. So unified purpose, you see that you have personal responsibility, expect opposition, and then you walk into this moment. And I, I, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a few weeks. It goes through and it says, they also, verse 5, offered regular burnt offerings and the offering required for the new moon celebrations and the animal, a- annual festivals as prescribed by the Lord. The people also gave voluntary offerings to the Lord. If you want to be a part of a, of a move that reaches the next generation, you see this everywhere that impacts the next generation, that the generations that precede have to be willingly generous, willingly generous. I, I'm telling you, I believe this more and more the longer I walk with the Lord. God's not out to get our money, but he is out to get our heart. And the Lord knows this, that when our heart is free from the love of money, our heart can be filled with kingdom joy. And I I just want to encourage every listener, every pastor, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Man, don't be afraid to call your people to radical generosity for the sake of doing whatever it takes to reach the next generation. Willing generosity. You see that happen over and over and over again. I'm moving quick here. It says, verse 10, it says, skip down to that. It says, when the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, the descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. Verse 11, when praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good. He is faithful. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. Every time you see a real move of God, revivalistic like move of God, there's there's this key ingredient. It's just always there. There's passionate worship. Passionate worship. Bill talked about this many times. You see this play out at Asbury. There there wasn't a show, but they were singing. And there was passionate worship. And here's what I hope. I hope it's not just passionate worship from the next generation. I hope it's passionate worship across generations, across as specifically to the local church, that that our older generation would give praise and worship with the next generation. And it wouldn't be about preference. It would be about his presence. It'd be about right praise to the one that is worthy. And then here's this last thought. You look inside of this passage of Scripture to help us believe. Verse 12 says, But many of the older priests, Levites, and the other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. And others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud voice that could be heard far in the distance. Now, there's, there's several thoughts around this, and I think that there's occasions where both of these uh, could be true. But are, is the older generation weeping uh, because they just changed the carpet in the temple, <laughs> the carpet color? Uh, I don't think so, personally. I know that that can be a religious response to new things. But you got to remember, they, they, they have not had the opportunity to worship Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah uh, in this setting in a long, 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 long time. So I think they're weeping, remembering, listen, remembering what once was. And then in the future generation, the new leaders are are praising him because they're getting to be a part of the establishing of the worship of their king for future generations. And so here, here's what I think. I think that the older generation is in awe that God's brought them back to this place to give God right praise. That they're, here's, here's the last thing to believe, and I'm believing for this that destiny is being restored, that God had designed his people to worship him this way, and now they're getting back to that place, and now the future generation, listen, they got praise moving forward in this place. 
they got purpose moving forward in this place to what future generation that God is restoring destiny. And so I, I, I want to encourage us as the church to believe for original intent. What did God originally intend for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Like the power of the Spirit moving through His people in such a way that it moves from generation to generation, impacts our nation and nations until our King parts the sky and comes back for us. So, Bill, that's that's just taking a few moments here to build our faith and see in this moment in Ezra 3 and to believe there's more to believe for right now. And, you know, what, you, what you're reading about and telling us about in Ezra, uh, what's so beautiful is that we are beginning to see that in our nation and mm -hmm. among the next generation and among, and particularly on college campuses right now. And, and when you're talking mm -hmm. about coming to this unified, uh, you know, this unity that unites us around something, I think part of that unity has come out of desperation. Yeah. I mean, old, older people, uh, this, my generation has finally realized, look, we're, we're sunk unless we see right. a movement of God. And the younger generation, uh, they look around at their lives and their friends and, and everything that's happening. And they're saying we're sunk unless we have something bigger than this. Right. And that's leading us back to this, this unified uh, passion for Christ and, and for really a movement of his spirit among us. And, and one other thing I want to comment that you said was this willing generosity. And we're going to talk about this in, in a future podcast here in the next few weeks. But not only giving, but the willingness to ju just give things away. I mean, you know, one of the great problems that happened in the Jesus movement in the 70s is many churches resisted the movement of God mm -hmm. as God was raising up leaders in the next generation. And they, mm -hmm. wouldn't, they wouldn't give away uh, the church. They wouldn't give away mm -hmm. leadership, you know, and it really quenched uh, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, boy, the Lord, Lord's doing it, and we, we join with everybody on this podcast and praying lord do it again that's Amen. right just do that's it right. again in our day and right. as he has so often done uh do it among the next generation particularly that's right well kyle we want to pray this in and mm -hmm. so we invite our listeners always to not just listen as kyle and i pray but to really pray with us in fact right. you may want to turn off the podcast and just spend time hmm. in prayer that what happened in Ezra's day and Nehemiah's day would happen in our day and would That's happen right. in our city and would happen in our nation. So Kyle, hmm. why don't you lead us out in that? And then I'll, yeah. I'll close our time. Father, we ask uh, even now, would you share your heart with us? Would you help us to see what you see, to feel what you feel and to respond the way that you'd want us to respond for the sake of future generations. God, we ask, Lord, the, the embers that are burning the college campuses now, Lord, would you let it turn into a fire? And, Lord, I, I pray that the church would cooperate with that work in every context, Lord God, that no matter if they're in a city where there's very few college-age students, Lord God, they'd believe for those that are there. And then, Lord, those that are in the, the midst of college cities, God, that they'd believe to be in it to see the extension of the church manifested through campus ministries, God, and college students, Lord. And I, I pray that nobody would get glory but you, God. That's nobody right. would get glory, but that there's a, there's a fresh wave that has crashed and that it is bringing about real change, Lord Jesus. So do it now and do it in our day and give us passion for it to pray that way until we see it so, I pray. And it and Father, just give us wisdom to know how to play our part, Lord, to mm -hmm. know what what's my role, what what's what am I to do, Lord? If I'm a if I'm a college student or a high school student, what what's what's my part of this? And if I'm a an older uh, mm -hmm. mature believer, what's my role in this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I pray, Father, that everybody's got a part to play in your movement and your activity. 
And we pray you would just not pass us by and that we would aggressive co- aggressively cooperate with you. Mm-hmm. And I pray in these podcasts over the next few weeks, Lord, you'd give us some help on how to do that. And, mm-hmm. uh, and we would see something and say, well, you know, I can do that. That's something mm-hmm. I can do to foster the movement of God and to cooperate mm-hmm. with him to see the next great awakening. So mm-hmm. Lord, we just love you. We're so, <laughs> we're just so grateful to be on this journey with you. And particularly in this moment, Lord, uh, when you're, when you're visibly manifesting yourself mm-hmm. to us, we thank you and we praise you in your precious name. Amen. 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 Well, we're so grateful that you joined us for the One Cry podcast. And again, this is about a six-part series as we're focusing on campuses and the next generation, what God's doing, what we need to pray for, how to, how we need to help foster that personally. And uh, I just hope you won't miss miss a single podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs>